I'll call the January 13th, 2015 study session of the Newport Beach City Council to order. Madam Clerk, can we have the roll call, please? The record will reflect that Council Member Muldoon is currently absent. Okay, first item on our agenda is clarification of items on the consent calendar. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, the reason we do this is to um, be able to ask staff questions you may have on items on the consent calendar that's coming up later in our regular agenda or if staff needs to perhaps develop some additional information prior to the regular meeting agenda. Uh, Council Member uh, Duffield, do you have any uh, uh, questions on the consent calendar? No, no, I'm good, thank you. Councilman Curry? No, Councilman Piotr? Uh, no, I understand that item three is going to be taken off already anyway. Okay, Councilman Petros? No. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon? No. Okay. And um, I have no items. Uh, study, study session item number two, that's the presentation from Newport Harbor High School Principal Sean Bolton. Uh, that's been canceled and that will be rescheduled to January 27th. Is that correct, Mr. Kiff? Uh, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before we move on to the study session items in later the regular agenda items, I thought I'd explain uh, to the council how I plan to handle discussion of council agenda items. Since we have four new council members and I found out today it's the first time this has happened in 20 years since 1994 when we instituted term limits. Um, I, I expect we're gonna have more discussion than we've had in, in the recent past and I think we can be more productive if we follow the following procedures. Uh, first, that the staff uh, will present their staff report and if each council member would hold their questions off until the staff completes their staff report. Um, I think that will make things go more efficiently initially. And then occasionally there will be a staff report where it's not necessary that for the staff to go into the report and we just go on to the next step. After the staff report's complete, then I'll call on each council member in turn for comments or questions on the staff report. Each council member may comment or pass on that. After the initial council discussion, I'll call for public comment. After public comment, I'll then again call on each council member in turn for further comments, questions, or motion. Uh, each council member may comment or pass at that time. And then from then on, further comments and discussion will be determined by the order of the computer queue, which I think you've all been um, instructed on on the request to speak button on our computer screen. And um, and then from that time on, the council members may queue in as often as they like to, uh, to speak. When all discussion ends, then uh, we'll call for the vote on motions or amendments to the motions. If these uh, procedures become too uh, cumbersome, we can change them later. However, I think it will allow us to at least get through our initial agendas this year in the most productive and even-handed manner. Does anyone have any objection to following this procedure initially? Mayor Selich. Uh, Council Member Petros. I think it goes without saying that just because you're called upon for an opportunity to speak doesn't mean you need to take it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Just wanna make sure that everyone gets an opportunity. Okay, with that, we'll move on to our, our first actual discussion item, study session item number three. This is the recap and lessons learned from the Civic Center project, uh, Mr. Kiff. Thank you, Mayor Selich and council members. Um, I'm gonna kind of talk about the format that we we're gonna do a staff presentation within and uh, remind uh, you and the folks at home that there is a staff report on the website um, and it uh, involves, it's kind of a, a text narrative about the pro this project's history. And then there are a number of attachments that we thought were helpful for the public and for the council to look at. Um, so please make sure if you're at home and curious about this that you check the website. Uh, our presentation today, Steve's gonna do a, what, what, he call, what we're calling the project in a nutshell, kind of a history of the project. It's not gonna be very long, it's about seven to eight minutes long. And then I'm gonna uh, do what uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon called lessons learned, and that's probably another 10 minutes. And then we'll be done, and we will welcome your questions, comments, or areas which you'd like to probe deeper within um, because we have a lot of backup information accessible to us here uh, um, today on the computer. Uh, we also have um, you know, the ability, obviously, to go back and, and work on this and come back to you later. But I did want to try to have at least a robust discussion with you 
and a robust uh, lessons learned and, and even some of the steps we've implemented already based on those lessons. So with that, um, Steve's going to begin to talk about the project in a nutshell. Thanks, Dave. Well, I'll jump right in. Uh, this is really essentially a brief history. As Dave said, there is uh, extensive uh, written uh, staff report that has a lot of this. But just to go back, um, we, you know, looking back, it was interesting. It, this is actually was about a 15-year process. It started all way back in 98 when uh, then uh, city manager Kevin Murphy uh, had a started a discussion with the council about the existing condition of the city hall complex where it was located on the peninsula at 3300 Newport. Um, that's, that just started a lot of conversation um, and to a point where in 2001, um, the conversation turned to, we gotta do more than just patch up this building, we should probably look at replacing it. So uh, for about five years, there was a process where we had hired a, a consultant to come on board, some architect uh, as well, to look at what could we do at this site. And that process proceeded. The next part of that was that during that process there's there's questions raised and one of them was uh, what location should it be? Should it stay where it is? The other one was do we really have the financial feasibility to do this? Um, and then then the kind of shifted gears um, and there was more and more discussion. It was kind of the setting of measure B which essentially was the was the measure that moved our city hall to its current location. Um, the committee, the citizen committee, did look at about 22, 23 locations and determined that um, the best location was probably the existing city hall site. And that was because they looked at this site and there was a lot of folks that were interested in building what was then called the Newport Center Park. And that was, there was a lot of interest in that. And so they decided that was too controversial. They decided that was not the place they wanted to be. However, there were a lot of concerned citizens in this town that decided that you know, they, we all really look, take a hard look at that. And uh, they were interested enough to develop a citizen-driven initiative, Measure B, to ask the question to the voters, should, where should the city hall be? And as it turns out, that, that measure passed, and here we are. Um, but it, it passed with a, a very kind of a, just barely a majority margin. And so our council decided, well, let's look at this a little closer. Let's see what we can do. Let's do this in a way that would be sensitive to both groups since it was kind of a divisive issue in the community at that time. And so the, the, the concept of the Civic Center in the park, or City Hall in the park, was, was born. And to move that forward, the council formed a citizen design committee. And that design committee was uh, local architects. Uh, there was five of them. And that group was responsible for developing essentially the parameters of the project. And at this, this is the point in time of the project where you could say the project grew because of the issue of adding the park into the project and then looking at um, the existing library and what, you know, this might be the only time we can get access to the back of that library. How do we connect that library to the Civic Center? Obviously something had to be done to the library as well. And we knew parking was an issue with the, with the uh, library where they knew that there was about a hundred space deficit in the library. So that was going to be addressed as well in the form of the parking structure. So that's kind of how the evolution of, of how the project started changing. Um, also, during the original process, there were a lot of folks that expressed the need that the, the, the building that was being proposed was essentially a very basic building. It was a tilt up. It was very austere. It was not a pretty building. Um, folks wanted something more than that. So the idea of a design competition arose and the design committee was charged with formulating the design parameters for that competition. Um, everything from uh, the floor plan to uh, the building heights to where the access ought to be, um, the kind of plants that we ought to use, uh, uh, and several other uh, issues that were, were formulated in that. At the end of that process, um, there were five firms that were selected as finalists. Each was given a stipend. And at the end of that process, the, the committee and the council ultimately selected Bolin Swinsky Jackson to do the design. They proceeded with that design, and we also had a building committee formed at that time, which also adopted two members from that design committee to serve with them to guide in this process of design. Um, we also, at the same time, decided to hire 
a CW driver, a construction uh, manager for the project, or actually a project manager initially, uh, until the construction would begin. And they came on board early so we could really kind of keep an eye on constructability along the way. So with the design, with the architect on board, the construction manager and city staff, we worked together along with the building committee uh, to formulate the design. At the end of that process, we decided to enter into um, a CM at risk project, a CM at risk contract. And what that is, it's a variation of a project delivery, which involves uh, selecting your uh, project manager by a uh, quality-based selection process, and then bidding out all the various trade packages competitively like a normal bid. And then that construction manager takes on the responsibility of delivering that project at a guaranteed maximum price. And we can talk more about that if you're interested about it. But um, the project did move forward, um, and of course, obviously we're here. Um, it did have a number of small change orders, about 700 in magnitude. Um, which represented about 6.1% of the total cost, which is in line with, with the industry norms. The all-in cost um, was about, uh, including the design, all of the other pertinent, the furniture, everything was uh, $141.7 million. Um, we also, at the time, we had to do a lot of repair work to the library. Um, unfortunately, um, the library at the time was almost about 10 years old, and we realized that some of the clear story windows, those are the windows that are up high on the north side, were installed incorrectly, and were having problems with um, leaking. And the plan called for, for removing and replacing those windows, but those windows were in such bad shape, we actually had to replace them. So there was about a $1.5 million cost to that. If you subtract that from the all-in cost, you could say that the city hall really cost $140 million. Um, we also wanted to note that we did uh, do a uh, bond. Um, uh, we did a bond debt of about 127 million. That also included some refinancing of bonds from the library. As you may recall, the the bond rates were ex really excellent then. I don't recall the exact percentage, but uh, it was kind of the bottom of the market for us. Uh, and then we used remaining cash of about 18 and a half million. Um, it was the largest issuance of debt by the city, but the debt service level of 4.72% of the general fund revenues was actually fairly small as compared to other cities across the Orange County. Uh, so that, and that number has been going down over the years, so we're proud to say. Um, I guess one of the things that we want to point out is the project did cause significant debate in the community. Uh, obviously, it's cost. Um, some of the uh, pertinences, the, the sale, the... Uh, the rabbits, of course, have been a lightning rod, and maybe even the, the cafe at one point was also part of that. So um, at the end of the day, you know, 15 years later, <laughs> we finally we have an expansion of the Central Library. We have a new city hall with a community room, a council chambers, a one-stop permit center, uh, and a disaster preparedness center in the basement. And, of course, the 15-acre park, in keeping with the folks that wanted the park, and do, that includes a dog park and uh, all the landscaping, low water plants, native plants all around. Uh, and then the pedestrian bridge that links the two sides of the park and our 450 space structure, 100 of which were needed for the library. And that is the project in a nutshell. Slide two, Steve, that has the cost. Uh, oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so and here, here's the breakdown. You know, we, we went back and looked at, um, you can see on the, on the, where it says hard construction costs, including the change orders. We broke down, we went back and looked at all the change orders and said, okay, you know, where do they all fit? Uh, and then we, we totaled up the actual hard construction costs were $114 million and some change there. Uh, then we took the soft costs, which were the design costs, the environmental costs, the cost for inspection, the cost for monitoring, um, and then our plan check costs, our outside plan check, and that uh, cost us uh, 22 million dollars and that was a portion to each one of course then we have ff &E for the library and the city hall and that's broken up into the various city hall components and then we had an um an owner controlled insurance program and so there was a cost for that uh that was also factored into the project and the, you can see the the uh, the costs by facility there on the on the uh, right side and the total of 141.7 and of course deducting the library repairs were down to 140.2 so oh, thank you, Steve. If you could call up then the word doc. So, uh, council members, I, I 
uh, Crystal distributed for you a sheet that looks like this. It's available for the for the public too. Um, this is what what uh, I worked on with Steve to say truly. What are our lessons learned from this, and um, and what where have we implemented what those lessons are? So the the first one. Um, we, we did have over 100 public meetings about this, including an environmental impact report and a number of times where we communicated directly with the public, including through our mailed community newsletter, which goes out to everybody, 54,000 addresses. Um, and I just kind of point to uh, next to Leilani is the, a stack of the, basically the staff reports that came to the council through those, a number of those 100 public meetings. But through all that, I, I mean, I fully recognize that the community um, didn't stay a pace with the project's pace, and in some ways, there were there were a number of people in the community that would have expressed an uncomfortableness for the change in the scope. And uh, so, I our lesson learned was we need to be better about using a variety of communication tools to find people where they're at versus the traditional ones that cities usually use, which is to call you here to talk to us. We need to go out and talk to you. Um, and you know, the community is in social media and we're there now too, but um, to me, the, one of the first lessons learned is something we already have done with the trash cart tour, where we were out on your doorstep, basically, in different parts of the community on Saturday mornings, talking to you, answering questions, and helping you order trash carts. Um, so uh, this is set up as a, the LL means a lesson learned, and there's a number with it, lesson learned number one. And then I also categorize it like an implemented action one, uh, or IA one. So those are those little codes behind it. Um, so those include more focus groups, which we also did with the trash outsourcing. Um, social media, we're ramping up. I think we're in uh, good stead. We always have a ways to go in terms of letting people know about anything from projects to traffic impacts. Uh, something that Nixle is a great way of learning about that if you don't know at home. Um, so we need to push all those things. We, we uh, began a system called Mind Mixer uh, with the West Newport Community Center, which was a way for citizens to get involved early in the design of something. And you can do that at home on the website and say what you like and what you don't like about a specific design. And I think that was successful, actually, in changing, sorry, guiding a little bit of the scope of that design for that project. That's not built yet. It's not done yet. The design isn't complete, but it did allow people to start to step in early. Um, and then um, my insider's guide, I, did try to, I do try to pump information out to people in a, a little bit traditional email, but um, to make sure that people know what's on the council's agenda, when, and how they can communicate with you. And then finally, um, I do take to heart very much that um, we need to finish up the website with this project. We need to put all the change orders up there, um, we have them all, and, and they're fairly clear. They're probably 8 to 12 to 20 pages a piece. Each one of those 700 documents um, has those kinds of pages and background to it. And we'll put all that up there and show it to you um, so, so you can take a look at that um, and, and follow it, follow the decision-making process. I'm going to move to the next lesson learned. If you can scroll down there, Steve, the next key lesson learned. And this, this is about Measure B. Um, I was around while Measure B was around. A number of folks were. And I would watch the, the campaign discussion, and you'd see numbers uh, bandied about. And I think all of us it's, it, the, in the city staff looked at those numbers and said, what do they mean? Do they mean all-in costs? Do they mean just hard construction costs? And, um, but we're not supposed to be involved in campaigns, so we're not. We don't, um, we don't advocate. We don't take one position or another. And to me, there's a lesson learned in that we, with, with council's permission, we would need to be more articulate about concerns when we see a community expectation being made that is not sustainable. It, it was not, it never would have been practical to have constructed an all-in cost city hall as was outlined in Measure B's cost. Or, so, um, that's a lesson learned. Now, nothing like this has been circulated again, but 
these concepts above and our engagement concepts can, can help us if that does surface again. Third lesson learned, uh, the early days of the design competition. Um, we, we think that the, the design competition, the parameters, and if you go and look at those, they did set a recommended cost per square foot for the city office building, the site improvements, and the parking structure. Sorry, and the parking structure's improvements were characterized as price per space. The parking structure did come in below that pricing, but the site improvements in the city office building did not. In fact, the, the, the city office building wasn't close to that number. So we th the lesson here is there should be a firmer tie between the uh, numbers like that that you expect to see and what's delivered. And uh, there's a way to do that, and that is uh, require the architect, the designer, to certify independently that um, this indeed, that, that when we ask for a price per square foot, they've certified that it can be delivered at that as an all-in cost. We, we didn't have that. Um, secondarily, just the, the discussion of the design competition, while it, it was a really r robust process, it does in a way set forth a, a nice vision, a dream vision that people want to attain versus asking ourselves, can we attain that? Should we attain that with the dollars that we have today? So I think a little bit more grounding of cost to the design process would have helped us there, a lot more grounding. And so where have we implemented this? Uh, our implementation has been with the Marina Park project. That was not a design competition. That was a community-based design discussion. We had uh, years and years of community meetings about what this park would look like. Everybody gelled on the, the, what it would look like, went out to bid. It is now under construction. It's on schedule and under budget. Um, so there was a community-based process rather than a design contingency. Sorry, with a, than a design competition. Um, similarly with Sunset Ridge, that was done the same way. That did come in on time and under budget. And in fact, Public Works is known for, for do, delivering those kinds of projects, and I respect that very and appreciate that very much. Let's move on to the fourth lesson learned. Um, this is about the bid climate. Um, I don't think it's a secret that we went to bid with plans that were not completely done. In other words, in November of 2010, um, the plans were about 90 to 95% done for the Civic Center project. And what we said was, um, the economy is so down right now and contractors are so hungry for work and have so many laborers either about to be laid off or sitting there that we should see what bids we can get with the designs we have right now. And there is a cost savings in that and there is an anticipated expense in that. And we were, our knowledge said at the time that the cost savings would outweigh the cost expense. We think it did that. But uh, what that did was, knowing that the designs were not complete when we went out to bid, the steel guys, the window guys, they all had ch uh, change orders uh, to look at. So we knew our change orders would be higher, but our pricing overall would be lower, and that the change orders would, the increase in change orders would be offset by the, the low economy at the time. And, and uh, we think we, we did achieve that. It's, it's Again, easy to say in hindsight, it's risky to do at one time. We don't think this is a good practice ordinarily. It's a practice that could come into play once or twice in a, in a career in terms of what the, re what the recession might look like. But so the implemented change is we have gone out to bid with fully completed projects, uh, fully completed designs for Sunset Ridge and Marina Park. And we expect this to be the same with the Corona Del Mar Fibrary, the West Newport Beach Community Center and more, again, assuming the council moves forward with those projects. So fifth one, um, some process improvements during project construction. And I'm gonna outline a number of these. Um, our contracts did not have formal or informal timelines to turn around what are called requests for information. This is when the contractor on the ground goes to the architect and says, I'm not sure what you mean by this design. This this combination where the steel meets the glass. So um, the, the architect was used to going at a certain pace and was a, at it was an industry standard pace, but we were pushing the schedule. So um, the, 
CW Driver as the major uh, contract ad administrator had, had projects lined up one after another here. Steel would go in at this date, windows this date, electrical this date. And if there was a, a delay in the request for information in the architect's work, it would screw up the project schedule. And that did happen. Um, so uh, because pushing the schedule hard and the no, no formal timeline for the RFI in the process, uh, we think that cost us. Um, we also didn't set forth industry standard contingencies with this project. We went to the council and said, the industry standard is to save about, or sorry, reserve about six to eight, even 10% in contingencies. And we said, you know, we're gonna try for two and a half percent because frankly, we didn't wanna leave money on the table and say that all that money, contractors, is available to you for this project. Um, but what it did was it made us come back to the council a number of times frequently to say, you know what, we didn't quite, we were too optimistic with our contingency. And those came in the form of contract change orders to the council. So um, I don't, in hindsight, that I'll tell you what the implementing actions are. We also extra insured this project. Remember, we were running um, for six months, probably, uh, sorry, about four months there in the beginning, we were running huge trucks out of this site every 30 seconds. And uh, we're excavating the site. There could be a possibility of traffic accidents. Um, you're digging down into the dirt. Anytime you do that and laying steel, we were just really nervous about the accidents that could happen here. So we, we had the contractor carry insurance and we carried insurance. And that was a belt and suspenders approach. It cost more. It probably cost a million, million and a half more to do that. But we didn't have any claims. So in hindsight, we're lucky to do that, but that's probably too much insurance. Um, so what are the implemented things we've changed? So um, we will, any, any type of contract like this will have an RFI turnaround in the contract time. We haven't had this type of project, so we haven't had these kinds of issues in our contracts to date. Uh, we do have more reasonable schedules for the projects that are ongoing today. Marina Park, Sunset Ridge Park, and the ones coming up, I think, are very reasonable schedules. We have normal contingencies in those projects. They're in the range of 5% for design and owner's contingencies. And we have normal insurance provisions in those projects. I will comment once a, a little bit. A number of folks have discussed, should you have had an additional third-party oversight to look at the city's work and CW driver's work and BC... Jay's work, and I think that's a fair question, but I'll just tell you how we looked at it. We're, our public works department is used to performing huge, complex projects, granted, not in the magnitude of this project, not $140 million, uh, but um, the Jamboree Bridge project was of immense complexity. The um, Oasis isn't an easy project. Sunset Ridge wasn't an easy project. Marina Park wasn't an easy project. So, and imagine the Corona Del Mar water transmission lane uh, line. So we do look at these things like we, we have a competent and professional staff to do this. And we think um, that this project was, had that kind of oversight and delivery. You know, you know others will disagree, but um, we're, we're, I'm comfortable with the qualifications of our staff in doing this. So I know we'd certainly welcome your comments about that in a bit. I'm almost done. Uh, finally, six furnishings, lessons learned. Um, we did, before we moved, we stopped making any investment, not any investment, but almost all investment in furniture. The, the chair I was sitting in was 18 years old. It was Kevin Murphy's, actually, and that's fine. You know, no big deal. But what we said was, let's stop buying furniture because we're going to move, and when we do move, let's buy something that's going to hold up. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about the pricing of that and whether it should or would hold up. Um, but I just want you to know that we did go through a thought process with that. We went through bids. We went through, and th these are bids at government rates. And um, the decision to purchase these kinds of things wasn't light. It was to try and make, emphasize durability. At the same time, remember, we live in a very litigious environment with a state that tends to be quite easy 
to make a finding of some ergonomic problem associated with a furnishing. So it's very important to me that we have furnishings that aren't going to cost us money in the long run. If I've bought the wrong chair for 280 employees, I'm going to pay through the nose for that, uh, through ergonomic claims. But so, but I really respect the how this resonated with the community. I'm not I'm not judging that. I really respect that. People looked at that and said, oh, my God, I can buy a chair at Home Depot for much less. And you can, but the things I look at are warranty and replacement. And But w the lesson learned and the implementing action is we need to be more robust with the council about that decision and the public. So it's it doesn't look like it's made in a vacuum. And you guys could choose. It shouldn't be our choice. It could be your choice. So indeed, we're trying to do that now with the Marina Park furnishings. And I think we're going through that right now, this exact period of time, as to what the appropriate furnishings are for that facility. With that, I'm going to stop talking. And uh, so those are our lessons learned. I have about, again, about at least 10 lessons learned. I have about 16 different things I've implemented from them. And I'm, I welcome your thoughts and the community's thoughts and comments about that. Thank you. OK. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon, you're the one that requested this item, so let's start with you. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve and Dave. I really appreciate this. And I, I think as you probably, in the short time that you put this together, so thank you for doing that, I'm sure as you went through it yourselves, you realized, huh, <laughs> if we had it to do all over again. And clearly the result of this highly complex project once you got into it, which is very different and more expanded and complex than Marina Park or Sunset Ridge Park. When all the variable pieces come together, it's very complex. I'm not going to get into furniture and things like that. I'm really going to step back and talk about process. And I've, in, over the years, I've been involved in observing and participating in discussions on large corporate headquarters. That's basically my experience on this. And probably to step back in terms of understanding how you go after a complex project. I know others here have developers and other engineers um, certainly may have a, a point of view. But I know the number one objective is to minimize risk on all parts to the, to the entity that's providing for it. So we want to, how do we keep this a, a manageable project? And my experience, and I think this is still true in building and development, is there's a, such a, a contractual arrangement between the architecture and the contractor called design build. And a lot of architects don't like this, a lot of contractors don't like this, but it is now common industry practice where they come together and, and they come up with the design, even after a, a separate external community-based design project or whatever, competition if you like. But then you come back to the architect, you come back to the contractor and say, these are our terms. If you're going to participate in this project for the city of Newport Beach, um, this, we're going to bid this package together. So in our case, I think the architect was separate over here and the contractor trying to get their arms around the architect. So nobody's really operating at that common, in a single package uh, process. And also you mentioned having an independent project manager. I think that's very common. Industry practice is to have an independent person. So, and, and in just in this discussion today, so it's it's not the staff person who was involved in that having to come forward, I think that puts the staff in a difficult and awkward position. So it's really lessons learned to go forward to how to manage a complex project. And we may say, well, I hope we are never going to have something like this. We w may we may have a police headquarters, which will be a highly technical building project. And so I hope what I'm saying today will inform that process. But a couple of macro points going forward to, to close the books. Um, the design and build, as I mentioned. Um, in looking at these costs, I didn't see any presentation of what was the original budget. I mean, you operate in budgets all the time here, and it, you're always really great at, at keeping things on budget. But as you go through a $100 million project like this, you, sit, you say, OK, here's where we're going to start. And the architect and the builder have agreed it's going to be X. And as 
as the governing body and the project management is constantly reporting against that spending amount. So the industry practices of, and I'm no contractor, of course, or developer or engineer, but industry practice would say, at least uh, uh, someone I know that was involved in the construction in 2000, well, about five years ago with the Ronald Reagan Medical Center at UCLA, a medical center, as you can imagine how complex that is, the average per square foot cost was in the 600, 680 range. I think if I do my numbers, and you could correct me, I think we were up to about $900 per square foot, if that's just the structure alone, because not the grass and not the parking structure. So if you look at some of these elements, I think we were over. Now, why were we over? I think it's because we didn't have this basic framework about keeping the architect and the contractor and somebody supervising them to say, you guys are going to sit in one room until you agree on a number and we won't go any further. So if you look at industry practices on parking lots, you could build a per stall parking lot for $10,000, even if you have multi-level, or you could go $25,000 per stall. I think we're up to twenty or $25,000. It, those costs got out of hand, I believe, because the architect and the construction person were working together. Also, it was kind of curious to me, and Steve, in your, somewhere in the report, I saw that there was a cost of $730,000 for building code compliance type issues. I mean, if the architect we hired didn't know the building codes in Newport Beach, I mean, and we didn't know this until it was too late, those kinds of things. The, the soil excavation, we should have put in the original design and build contract that if there's <coughs> soil to be excavated, somebody other than the city of Newport Beach has responsibility to find a buyer for that soil. So to be told many months down the line, it was, well, nobody wants our soil. I guess it's too bad. We've got to spend $8 million. Those kinds of things, I think, can be prevented going forward. That's what I'm saying. I think we, we've got a very expensive, over-industry standard building and facility here. I'm not going to debate rabbits or passenger bridges or anything. I, I'm really more concerned about process. And so what I'd like to see further, if I may, is maybe bring in, and in, we've never brought in an independent review, to bring in an independent review to, say, going forward, before we build another major building, which will be highly complex as the police headquarters, how do we structure a design and build process? How do we do this differently from a process standpoint? And that's really where I'm looking. And I, I, I will leave it that way, is that I think a process can help save the city money, it make us look uh, like we know how to challenge in these kinds of things, and we don't have to accept when someone says, well, you got to pay it, and you rushed us too much. We should, that should have been nailed down at the beginning. So the fact that this beautiful complex got built and <laughs> on time, but in it, you mentioned it, the lead sentence about wanting to get the best cost for it because of the recession. Where did, how much money did we save because of the recession? I don't know if you could even figure that out. We have anyway. calculated that. Yeah. Anyway, again, my point is, and I appreciate you doing this. It, this was, uh, in my view, a good first step. I just would like to get an independent and I don't want to spend a lot of money doing this, but somebody with that expertise in construction, project management, to say going forward, if we were to do this, what are the key steps we should do and how to keep it on track all the way through the process. So thank you very much, and thank you both for, for doing this. I appreciate it. Okay, Councilman Curry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> well, it was with no degree of... Uh, can you go back to the slide that shows the project component cost? Or by... by project element. Uh, that one, yeah. It, it's with no small amount of irony uh, that we go back to Measure B. I actually, as many of you know, led the opposition to Measure B and uh, said at the time that this was going to be a more expensive option than building it where the Irvine Company subsequently built a 20-story office building. We would have been in that facility two years earlier. We would have been sharing their parking structure, which they would have built, and they may or may not have built this tower. Nonetheless, and I think Councilman Selich, you were the one, the first one at the time that said to put the $100 million price tag on the cost of building here at this facility. And I think it was good that we went back and we got the Measure B campaign material, City Hall in the park, which certainly contemplated that we would continue to have a park here. But the park had to change in many ways its nature 
because it was now adjacent to a city hall as opposed to being pretty much left the way it would have been had we, uh, had we not built city hall here. Uh, and the advocates for Measure B, many of whom are the biggest critics of city hall today, uh, told us that uh, it was adjacent to the library with synergism. I'm not actually sure synergism is a word, but presumably what it means is a door on this side of the library so you can get into it from the city hall. And you'll recall that uh, right now you walk out the front door of City Hall and you look in the second floor window of the library. Had we put a door in without expanding the library, you would have had quite a first step to get to the books. Uh, it talks about neighbors and public views being protected. In order to protect the public views, it was necessary to move 200,000 cubic yards of dirt at a cost we now know of $9.7 million dollars. And while I think it's just great to believe that we could have required people to uh, mandate that we have a buyer for it, there is a market for these things. And in 2010, when we were under construction, uh, there was no market because there was nobody building anything hardly but us. So it had to go other places that we had to pay for, and that was the cost. And we were moving trucks out of here at about every 30 seconds, uh, moving that dirt in quite a, lo a logistical approach. Uh, People suggest that we didn't really listen enough to the community during the process, but I encourage everybody to go back and listen and read the minutes, because we have about a thousand people in our community who are signed up for CERT, and whatever filled the old city hall site to about two-thirds, maybe 80 or 100 of them showed up to say that we needed a community emergency center located here, not located at the old city hall site, and as you can see, that added about four point four million dollars to the cost. Uh, the library, which gets 1.2 million visitors a year, it is next to the beach, our second most popular attraction in the entire city, uh, cost an additional 18 million dollars. Now some have suggested we didn't need the library, we didn't need the park, and we don't need the parking structure. Well now that it's built we can imagine what outside would look like if we had a four-story parking structure and instead of that we had a lot four times larger than the structure is currently. We wouldn't have a civic green, we wouldn't have much of a park, we wouldn't have a connection to the library. Uh, those were things that the community asked for as part of the public process. And we can look back and say well if I'd been there I would have asked for something different. But the people who did show up, who did ask for things, they asked for the library to be expanded. Much of the money actually was actually raised privately, at least some of it. Uh, and they asked for uh, an emergency operations center. And they asked for a community room, which is one of the most frequently used facilities in the entire city, uh, now that it's here on this side of town and available uh, for the community to use. City Hall itself cost about uh, $69 million, $73 million with FF&E. Uh, so when people talk about the cost of City Hall, this building, that's the one that they, or that building, that's the one that they should keep in mind. Now, they did have a diagram here. It shows two square buildings. They look more or less like warehouses that were going to be, that's the roof line, that were suggested to be the city hall. So we can think about whether or not we would have been a better community if that's what city hall looked like. If instead of having the connection to the library, we walked down steps through a parking lot, because they do show a, a single row of parking here, and uh, walked in the, through the, uh, the air conditioning vents into the, uh, into the back side of the library. I mean, that was one vision of what could have been built here. Uh, so I would simply say, first of all, I agree with my colleague that going forward on major projects that we need a tight process. Uh, we had a process here, and, and by virtue of the many moving parts of this, it, it did get a little out of control. Uh, but I don't think we need to spend a lot of consultant money now going through useless studies until we know what the building is we're going to build when we can have a study that focuses more on the specifics of what's, what we're going to do going forward and can make it more specifically relevant to what we're going to do. And to those who want to challenge the scope of this building, here's the list of projects. Tell us what it is we should not have built. Should we not have had a parking structure? Should we not have expanded the library? Should we not have had a community room? Should we not have had uh, the uh, emergency operations center? Those are the real-life options. Those are what really count when you're making decisions about million-dollar decisions in terms of the cost of this project. So I, um, I'm glad we went through this. It's very clear that we have uh, paperwork that answers anybody's questions about how we got to here, that answers questions about how the cost got to where the cost got to be. And I invite my colleagues to have at it and go through those stacks and answer all the questions to their heart's content. 
I appreciate staff going through the process to do this today. I think it's time for us to move forward and um, uh, with the other capital needs that we have in our community. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Piotr. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I don't think anybody wants to, to beat a dead horse, but we also don't want to repeat our mistakes. And I, I observed from the outside uh, during the construction, I was not part of the uh, hearings or the committees. Uh, obviously, maybe I should have been. The uh, building a little bit more on what um, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon was talking about. You know, what I, what I didn't see in the report, I didn't see things like in the processing or in the process uh, programming you know does the actual final design meet the needs that we actually have did we hit it on where it needs to be <clears throat> could we have uh, or does it accommodate growth or contraction as the mark as the economy goes up and down uh, could we could a lesser project have achieved the same thing I don't see that those things were evaluated during the process it was more of a uh, oh yeah we need some of those let's put it in uh, you uh, you know, who is responsible for the o overall project control? Uh, was the architect in charge for this programming and determining what the space needs were for the different departments, the different personnel that were part of that? I don't know. That wasn't answered in the, in the report. Uh, the same thing can happen in future projects, including the community center. You know, who, who decides the programming decides how big the building is? Uh, then you have the design. Uh, you know, were the costs considered prior to the design decisions? We've got an incredibly expensive roof that ended up adding a lot, multi-million dollar additional cost to it, as well as the chief culprit for the delays uh, of the project. Uh, you know, when they made the decision to go with that design, did they know that it was going to cost $10 million more or $15 million more? I don't know. Uh, you know, we had the original idea of a, as uh, Mr. Batham suggested, a vanilla tilt-up building on the existing site, and then we had the current project, which we characterizes the Taj Mahal were there anything was there anything in between that was considered and why was it rejected and again you know if we decide that we're going to build this monument which I think that's what the measure B supporters are objecting to you know was there a conscious decision based on the cost on what we were getting for what we were spending I don't see that it just seemed to you know increase like Councilman Curry said you know we had I call it scope creep, but he said we expanded the scope. We expanded the library. The original Measure B proposal was just to reorient a secondary entrance. Uh, we added 17,000 feet to the library. You know, so we had scope creep. Uh, our park is now a fully developed park. It originally was supposed to have an amphitheater and be a more usable park, although not have active ball fields. Instead, we have a couple of sidewalks, repairing and wetlands, and a, a couple of viewpoints. And I know everybody wants to say, and bunnies. Uh, we also have an emergency operations center. You know, do we need that? Is that part of the new police station plans? If the new police station gets built, do we need this EOC? And those questions may have been asked, but again, I don't see that we saw those responses. Uh, you know, we have a, a much larger facility than was anticipated. You know, we had a 50,000 foot facility, and then that grew because we included conference rooms and public spaces. Uh, but we also and we added the community center and other scope increases that way. Uh, the grading we lowered to accommodate views. I mean, were there alternative heights or elevations considered, and what the impacts were to the views, and how much we were impacting, and did we select the least obtrusive, the medium obtrusive, or the most obtrusive? I don't know. You know, the Measure B uh, flyer that Mr. Curry refers to has a couple of squares shown for the building. And those couple of squares could still have been a very well-articulated, well-designed facility, not glass with wavy roofs. And the fact that it wasn't a long, skinny building would have been a whole lot more efficient. The amount of exterior skin you have in our facility today for the amount of square footage you have inside is incredibly out of proportion to what a, a real developer would do who was watching his own money. Again, the perception is, is that, hey, it's not my money. We're just going to build it because it's cool. Um, the the building design itself i mean was i saw in part of the original staff report that we didn't include the construction estimate as part of the design competition so it sounds to me like the wave roof design with the sale on the on on the civic center the costs were not considered when we selected it you know 
I like that too. Hey, I'm not paying for it. I'll have one of those. Hey, give me two of those. You know, we've got a very expensive roof design. We've got that incredibly uh, bad or inefficient uh, proportion building. And we put every single parking space, as, as Councilman Curry has indicated, in a structure, which is the most expensive way to park. So those are the kinds of evaluations that I didn't see in the report as to why they were made, whether or not they had or realized the cost impacts when they made them. And those are all critical as part of an overall project and design. Again, the perception is that nobody considered costs when these things happen. They just said, yeah, we need an EOC. Let's put one in. We may have needed an EOC. Now, does it qualify for a, is it hardened? Does it qualify for all of the things that a real emergency center qualifies for? Can we get rid of the one in the police department? You know, I hear that it's not hardened and that we can't get rid of the one in the police department. So it acts as a secondary center. Again, I, I don't see the evaluation process when that occurred when you increase the scope. So I see increasing scope that everybody just added on. I see incredibly expensive decisions when we did have a decision to make we chose the most expensive ones uh, and then that comes down to how was this all managed you know it's easy to point to the change orders because that's kind of a black and white situation you know we have 700 plus change orders wow that's a lot of change orders percentage wise and cost of construction it's moderate but we had a very expensive construction process now I don't know how many of those change orders were included as part of the extraordinary cost of the grading and things like that but uh, and, and grading, no matter how you do it, when we're dealing with an uncompacted, un, unstructured fill site, it's a big unknown. I don't care how many holes you drill ahead of time, you're going to get surprises. I understand that. That's part of it. So maybe that grading is a number you pull out when you evaluate the efficiency. Um, it is a situation, though, that, um, you know, yes, we misguessed the market for dirt, and perhaps if we had, had a more accurate estimate on, on what the dirt was going to cost us, we would have chosen the medium view obstruction rather than the no view obstruction. So, I mean, those are the decisions that are going to play a part in other buildings as well. I mean, even in Marina Park, you know, what was the original scope? What was the original estimate? What was the original size of that, uh, that community structure and sailing center? Was it originally planned to be 60 feet tall before... The, the lighthouse and antennas go in. I don't know. I wasn't part of that one either. But I'd sure like to know up front before I make any decisions on West Community Center or any other of the major investments that we're looking to make. And so I would favor Mayor Pro Tem Dixon's suggestion that we have an outside analyst look at it. And I would be interested, hey, how do we compare to other cities? Other cities of Newport Beach's stature, other cities in Orange County that you know, maybe didn't spend quite as much money and never intended to, but we did. That's fine. But, you know, when you look at a hospital project and it costs 600 bucks a foot and you look at our project and it costs $1,200 a foot, you have to wonder what's wrong with the picture. Did we really get that much more compared to what you'd have in a hospital? So I would be fa in favor of uh, pursuing a, not an expensive overview, but at least a surface scope uh, review and overview. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Petros, do you wish to comment? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I, uh, I think that the presentation was very well made, uh, and I do appreciate uh, the remarks that have been made at this, to this point. I think it's always prudent for us to have a review of the work that we do uh, before we undertake it. And I, I, too, as we move forward, would uh, recommend and look forward to outside reviews of our building practices of, of the, the projects that we're going to undertake to make sure that we are being uh, wise with our expenditures. I would make a couple comments, though, that um, I remember as a citizen uh, coming to the old city hall in 2007, 8, 8, 9, and walking down the hallways and seeing on the walls all of the renderings that the uh, architects were working up at that time and being asked as a citizen, as was everybody else walking through there, what did I think of those, uh, those concepts? What was my take on them? The public had that opportunity for years, for years to, to, to join in in that. And, and there were many that did. As was mentioned, over 100 meetings were undertaken to, to develop this concept. And as, as that happens, 
when you ask over and over and again, the, 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 the wish list grows, and we have a project now that reflects more of what the community wanted than a simple, simple city hall site. It now has greater utility. But there was a, an extreme amount of push out in the community that I saw. I attended those design meetings uh, and listened to the presentations made. They were all day long, all day long, presentations made by architects. And then the follow-up of those renderings in, and the models in the old city hall site. I've done uh, work at hospitals. I have sat in on those proposals. And, and as one who, who works in this, I understand there's three things. You can build it fast. You can build it cheaply, or, or you can fast, cheap. What's the third one, Scott? You can build it fast or quality. cheap or, yeah, high quality, but you don't get all three. Pick two. And so I think that when we were starting to push on the schedule, that that really had a lot to do here. And I would strongly recommend that as we do move forward and review, uh, have an outside review, that schedule be one of those considerations because we need to build in enough time so that we can manage that budget. I can tell you as one who was on the tail end of this that it, I was being brought in when it felt like decisions were already made and, and I just could throw my hands up because the schedule was driving this thing so much. So um, those are just the general comments that I would make at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Muldoon, any comments? Okay, uh, Councilmember Duffy. Well, I uh, lessons learned. I would thoroughly like to congratulate Dave for his uh, his report. I would think that's going to be a very hard report to do and um, to look back and be asked to. What are, what are all the things I did wrong? You know, that's, that's, and I appreciate what you did, and I think that um, if we applied those lessons learned, um, this building might look a little different. And uh, so that's all good. And I appreciate um, Councilman Dixon for her uh, looking into this and studying it the way she did. I think that looking forward in the process is going to be very... Uh, productive for us so I think all is good and I don't want to look back and be negative about all this I think we're moving forward and um, again the staff coming up with that um, lessons learned and future lessons learned is all good thank you thank you <clears throat> I'd just say that um, I was part of the uh, building committee that um, worked on this project uh, from its inception Initially, it was uh, um, Don Webb and Steve Rosansky and myself, and later Rush Hill joined, and then, as Councilmember Petros mentioned at the very tail end, <clears throat> um, he got on the building committee. I just want to point out that one of the major jobs of the building committee was to do what's called value engineering, is, and most of our task going through the review of this project was continually to take a look at all the different choices we had in terms of materials and uh, getting the materials that would provide the best value to us in terms of long-term maintenance at the least amount of cost. And we spent a lot of time going through and evaluating um, just a lot of different things, whether it was ceiling materials, flooring materials, whatever, to make sure that we got the best value. But we also did not just buy on price alone so that we would have to replace these items in, in a very short period of time. Um, public buildings like this take a lot of hard use and a lot of abuse, and so uh, you really have to take a look at the durability of the materials and the furnishings that you buy to make sure that you're not spending your initial money foolishly because if you spend it foolishly at the front end, you oftentimes pay a lot more down the road. Um, I thought the staff report did a good job in... Uh, in, in reviewing the process. Um, I don't know what more I can add to uh, what's already been said, other than I always welcome uh, coming up with ideas and looking at ways as how we approve, improve our processes uh, in the future. So with that, I'll take uh, public comments. Anyone wishing to address the council, please come forward and state your name.
Roy Engelbrecht, 2012 Vista Cone in Newport Beach. I'm coming back to the council meeting tonight because of the firing agenda item, but I thought my public comments would be better served at this study session than tonight. I'm here to call your attention to the really unprecedented mandate that the voters put forth in November. As a political junkie, as an observer, I, I can't realize and I don't realize I've ever seen this mandate that was given by our residents to our city council. We had a councilman representing the old guard, the establishment, who was, who was also the mayor, crushed. We had a Measure Y that was supported by the council, the establishment, and the city, crushed. We had two sitting city council people who ran for other offices, crushed. The residents of our city screamed, get control of our spending, get control of our city salaries, get control of the out of control overtime spending, and pass meaningful, and the key word is meaningful, pension and benefit reform. Now, I don't read Governor Brown very much, nor do I agree with Governor Brown very much. But when he writes this on Friday, I will pressure state employee labor unions to help reduce the state's unfunded liabilities for retiree health care benefits, which have grown from $485 million in 2001 to $10 billion now. And you know what? He says the word that I use at every one of the eight campaign stops that we had. He says this cost is unsustainable. He also said I will propose that state and its employees share equally in paying now for future retiree health benefits. Thank goodness Governor Brown has seen the light. Team Newport, you ran your campaign on promises. Cut costs with fiscal responsibility. Debt reduction. Revitalize our harbor. Be transparent and be responsive to residents and respect their opinions. You talk the talk during your campaign. Now I pray that you will walk the walk in every area of our city government. The residents have spoken, and they have given you a clear and strong mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Next speaker, please. W.R. Dilding. I just stepped down December the 17th after 30 years, five weeks, and 17 days on a state commission dealing with public works. I recall back in 19... 79, we did not have a public contract code. We had one, I believe it was, the first one was in 80. It was uh, abolished and redone, I believe, in the 82. In 19, was it 03? Come on, Mr. <coughs> Kiff, don't laugh at me now. I was challenged by my colleagues to come before the Newport City Council and challenged the legal authority that they had at that time to use design build. After that meeting, I was never called, or the following meeting, I was never called so many names by the architect that was involved regarding his project. But today we've come a long way. I've got a stack of different proposals. Two gentlemen sitting over here probably know more about them than I do. But design build at that time was only allowed by a few counties and the, the agencies within them. The schools got into big trouble. We did not get into big trouble other than the controversy that's out there on the table today. If you were going to go with a new project today, there would be two or three different avenues, correct, that you could pursue and protect your hide. But... In looking at the cost estimates or the breakdown, very thorough. I've looked at that type of thing. Construction costs money. 
couple of the big items is workforce. How far do they have to travel? You know, when you take a job in City Hall, you know that's where you're going to have, that's a consideration, the time element, the parking, and all that. Watching these projects down on the peninsula right now, good God, they're parking down <laughs> almost at the, in the Balboa parking lot for places to park at the crab cooker. The remote air foot, the governmental facilities, the travel time. I did a job for Caltrans up in Bridgeport out of Santa Barbara County. Mistake. But I think you're a lot better off. I think we should be proud of what we have. I think the workmanship, from what I have seen, is very good. I've had one chuckle over the time when it was first opened up and Lani had so much trouble getting the things to work up here. It was Roseton Electric. I remember that I was the first subcontractor through them on Vandenberg Air Force Base when we were going to build the shuttle launch facility there. So I think before I'd go out and spend money, I would inquire of some of the professional groups as to what material is available for you. I have some. I'll be welcome to, to pass it on. And I, I think... It's, it's been kind of a joke to me to listen to all the cry. Have you ever built a house, a custom house for yourself? Our architect, friend, excuse me one second. How many change orders? Did you ever sell, sell, uh, satisfy the customer? At times you went home and you thought you were just a draft, draftsman. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Next speaker, please. Mayor Selich and members of the City Council, my name is Jim Mosher, and I'd like to make two comments on the Civic Center construction process. Uh, first comment has to do with Measure B from 2008. Whatever the hype may have been during the election, the actual language of it was fairly simple and concise, and it amended the City Charter to require the construction on this site of a new City Hall that would contain all the administrative offices of the city. Somehow today we have a city hall that does not contain all the administrative offices. Most notably missing are the police administration, the municipal operations people, who are the ones you go to if you have a problem with lights, street sweeping, water, sewage, and the Harbor Resources Department question arises in the process, how did we get not quite what we voted for? Uh, city staff, I believe, understood that all didn't mean quite all. And in 2012, as part of Measure EE, the charter was quietly amended to change all to most. But I think the lesson learned from this is we all, whether it's a voter initiative or not, need to strive to achieve clearly written laws that are clearly understood in the same way by everyone and that we faithfully follow them. Second comment about the process I want to make is the one that Mayor Selich touched upon at the end, which is about the so-called building ad hoc committee. I would like to be able to say more about it than I could, but about all I can say is that committee was formed way back in 2003 to consider design concepts for a reconstruction of the old city hall at 3300 Newport Boulevard. Over the years, it took over design review for the Oasis Center and then for the Civic Center. I know so little about it because in recent years, in the four years I've been watching the city process, that committee met entirely in secret. The net result of that is that it screened and at those meetings, since I don't know what happened at them, I have the impression that city staff ran design ideas, changes, and so forth by the committee and took that committee's direction of just three council people as representing direction from the entire city council. I think the lesson learned from that is that's not a good practice and the public's business should be done in public. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Mayor, Council, Denise Oberman. I wanted to thank you for having this session. I think it is very important. I agree not to look backward, but more importantly, to truly learn and 
create policies and direction to staff uh, so that we can move forward responsibly as a city. So I still don't feel as a resident, uh, and I, I acknowledge the hard work of the staff, that I really understand what the accounting, either the process or the ultimate outcome is. I still don't understand how a third party construction manager at or not at risk, and I approve of that, having a, a third party construction manager in principle, I think that was, that was sound thinking. How, how did that person manage? I, I would like to know the answer to it because if the budgets that were in people's heads or the concepts were in people's heads were A, not clearly and publicly stated and B, perpetually changing through scope creep, how on earth could the construction manager or anyone else for that matter measure performance? The scope, the output, the budget. So I, I still don't see the answer to that. And, and I, I would be curious to know how much CW Driver was paid as a third party construction manager. And ultimately, how, were, how was their performance directed and their performance evaluated? Uh, if we are as a city going to use third party construction management as a matter of practice, uh, through outsource or just on a project by project basis, they're gonna have to receive some direction. And, and what I see from this project is that there was no direction uh, because there was a philosophy implicit and explicit in actions that the sky was the limit, that we could always get more money. We're a wealthy city and we have high limits of development fees. I don't think we can go that direction anymore. And as importantly, it's just imprudent, and the residents don't want to go that direction of unconstrained development resulting in potentially unlimited development fees. There is a limit to how much development we can have and maintain the integrity and the transportation flows in the city. So I encourage you also, Council, going forward, in addition to having an independent review, which I feel should report to uh, council that was not actively engaged in uh, oversight of this project to look forward. Also to look at the budget, and I understand the budget is in process for the fiscal year being at the end of June, we're going into July. What are the assumptions that are in this budget? Are they, is it basically unconstrained or is it conservative? Does it assume a certain level of development that perhaps is inconsistent or not aligned with what the residents want to pursue and what is wise for the city to rely on. So I ask those questions. I appreciate your direction. Thank you again. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Tim Stokes, Santa Ana Heights. Um, Steve, would you put your budget back up there for me? budget the yeah the actual um i'd like to speak to one issue by the way my pedigree is i i get to work and, and pleasure working for a 66 billion dollar company down the street called allergan that i get to be the owner rep building their parking structures and buildings so i have a little bit of um uh war wound on my on, on my back i what i'd like to talk about is one thing i i decided to take a look at this last night and one thing um from the um, closeout report, um, the city and CW driver received a bid from the um, three pre-qualified uh, bidders to design build. Remember, design build the 450 uh, space parking structure on September 14, 2010. The city, city council approved the amendment to amendment number one to CW driver and contracted the design build parking structure in, to with, with Bone Mill Construction and a subcontract as a subcontractor and amended the, um, the GMP to $7.4 million. As it looks up there, a design build contract is a full in type contract. So you, you give it to a contractor, they don't get a portion of the $1.4 million that's included in design and management as, as I understand a design build contract. Since I had at pretty much at the same time in 2009 when this was going on, Allergan was building the same thing with another company called um, um, Snyder Langston, and guess what? Our parking structure was being built by Bomel as well. Um, needless to say, I, I pulled the old uh, 
the quotes from um, Snyder Langston. And I did the math on um, what um, 450 stalls cost up there is a little roughly um, the parking structure, 450 stalls divided by $9.1 million came to $20,300 per stall. That's not industry standard. And at that time, parking was coming in at between ten dollars and $8,000 a stall. So did we get good value for a parking structure? I'm not going to get into the design aesthetics of the building and the wavy roofs and all that other thing, but parking structures are easy because they're just concrete and rebar and not much design and they just fit, fit cars. So my question is, why was $1.4 million allocated to the design if the park, if, if Bowmill got a contract for 5.7 for a design build contract? And then why do we keep overstating industry standards from um, the, the staff perspective of you guys think you're hitting building standards? You're not hitting building standards. At that time, I can, I'd be more than happy to share our information from um, Snyder Langston and Bowmill Construction of how much those, those costs were. Um, where I have it here, excuse me, it's on the back here. But as you see, ours was, uh, we even got a reduction at the time we went back and said Bowmill needed to move construction managers and stuff like that into different projects. They offered it as a 13% discount at that time too. So I don't think that the city got good value for its structures. I don't, I'm not here to debate color, roof size, the fact that this thing has a wavy roof and how many leaks we're going to get in the future, that sort of thing. I think to strengthen uh, uh, pro tem Mayor Dixon's position that a private person should go back and maybe audit these types of costs for those industry standards. Because Thank I think you, what's presented is incorrect, inaccurate. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Laura Curran. I live in Corona Del Mar. So, first of all, Ed, I thought your proposal for Newport Center was a really great proposal. So I was sorry to not see it get put forward. Um, what I want to talk about is a theme um, that goes along with the request for a bottoms-up look, starting with the original cost and then building up by project section and cost type to a final cost. Because consistently over the years, I've talked about the fact that our financial analysis is often very general. And we don't do a good job of looking at facts and impl implications. And I'll just take in the report a couple examples. It says on page 16 that we have gone from 833 to 729 full-time equivalent employees in Newport Beach. But what it doesn't tell us is how many employees actually work in this building or have interface in this building and the related number of residents. That would be useful information. It states that there are 187 square feet per employee in the building. But what would really be useful is to know how many square feet are for employee workspace, which in most locations continues to be reduced, and how many square feet are allocated to the general building. It talks about the outsourcing of plan check to Anderson, over $1.4 million. It doesn't really tell us what that plan check was, was for, how many hours of plan check, which buildings had the most plan check, and I tried to find the report online, and the link was dead. So, you know, that's good information that can be encapsulated very quickly in a report like this so that it provides more color. Um, so, project oversight, things such as travel costs and professional services. We had a situation where BCG was overseeing PW partners and some work had to be redone and um, in the park. And Jan Vandersloot and I pointed that out to Dave. And Dave and Steve, I give them credit, they stepped right in there. And we worked with them to course correct. And we have a park which represents the direction of council and Orange County's natural habitat and is very active and widely used by the public. Um, but we don't know, um, and this report doesn't tell us, if PWP charged us for that work or if it was done as a rework because of their error. So that would be good information to know. Um, so I've brought this topic of financial analysis up 
over the years at lots of council meetings. And while I enjoy learning about council business, I'd be happy to come to fewer meetings um, on, related to financial analysis. And some would say, well, a city's not a business. You can't apply the same um, strategies to business to cities that you do to business. But I think in terms of financial analysis, we can apply the same level of scrutiny and having that culture of what are the facts and what are the implications and are we really telling a good story? So that's something I would ask this council as you come in and you all bring different experiences to our council to really work with staff. And I know Dave is always trying to bring that forward too. And, and so that when we're reading a report, we really do have a lot of color and we understand the full story. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Any other speakers? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to council. <clears throat> this is a study session item, so we don't take official action here, but it is helpful for us to give staff some indication of where we'd like to see this go in the future. There's been at least two suggestions that we have a further in-depth study. One suggestion that uh, maybe we're better off to defer that. So I think it would be good to go back through the council again and uh, express your thoughts so the city manager can uh, have an idea of where the council wants to head on this and whether we should put it on a future agenda. And I see him waving his finger. Mr. Mayor, if I'm doing my job for you, I'm trying to characterize also what I've heard. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I was trying to um, listen to Mayor Pro Tem Dixon and, and Council Member Piotr. Um, this is what I came up with. Um, direct staff to come back to Council with a review of um, the construction and design approaches that could be used going forward and, and even offer recommendations for t types of future projects that could be used with a particular design approach. And again, just recommendations, not direction per se, but with a look back at this project as an example of a construction manager at risk uh, project. So there'd be some look back at the lessons learned and the complexity of this one with a rec recommendation going forward. So that would be one recommendation that I've heard from you. And the other, I, I would just want to respond to the folks who who spoke today and from the public as well. We, we will make every effort to uh, have that robust website put up and I'm more than happy to work with each one of you. If you see something that's missing and you say, Dave, I want that put on there, we'll do all we can to put on there. So uh, that's uh, kind of the second part of the effort. But okay. I don't you. know if I hit the mark or not, but I'm anxious to hear what you think. Well, we'll find out, I guess. Uh, Mayor Pro Tim Dixon. I think that, that hits it. I mean, uh, again, this is perspective, how we look at managing uh, tens of million dollar construction project that has many complexities going forward and what the process is, what the key roles and responsibilities are of the outside folks that are going to do it. But And to just look at where we can see, we can't undo this, but how can we avoid scope creep and uh, just how can we avoid that going forward? And we start out with a budget and we end up with the same budget or less. So thank you. Councilman Curry. Well, I understand where I think my colleague wants to go with this, and I think the, and I, and I don't disagree with the need to have that information. The way to do it, though, is in the context of a specific project getting ready to move forward and looking within the context of that project, what is the way that we can manage its construction, that we can set its design parameters, and we can limit the construction cost risk. I recall in 2007, then Chief Bob McDonald came forward and wanted us to do a police facilities utilization study for the police station uh, and thought that it was absolutely essential that we do it so that we knew what the new police station was going to, going to look like. Well, that's four police chiefs ago. It's an entirely different command structure ago. It's a change in the uniform building code ago. Uh, and we have uh, an entirely different location where we're looking to put the police station. Had we commissioned that report at that time, we would have had a nifty report, some consultant would have gotten a nice bonus, and it would be gathering dust someplace absolutely completely useless. So I think, uh, I, I don't disagree that as we go forward on specific projects, let's look for the ways that we can make them more efficient and, more, uh, 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 and protect the city's financial interests better. That's certainly something we should always look at. But I think it'd be unfortunate if, the, uh, to quote my friend Mr. Engelbrecht, if we 
kick off the new year and all we do instead of saving taxpayers' money is commission a bunch of consultant studies that answer more esoteric questions and not specific and not are specifically addressed to projects that are ready to go now in a way that their information could be usable. Councilman Piotr. I think I'm going to propose something more along the lines of what Mayor Pro Tem Dixon was suggesting, and, and that is to uh, have an outside consultant compare some of these costs. I would love to see staff come back with an RFP trying to delineate the scope so that we can see and get what we want. Uh, but as was brought up in public testimony, as we brought up, uh, comparing you know what we got for industry standards, both from a cost per square foot basis and the amount of space for like facilities, uh, you know, per employee or what have you. Uh, I'd also like to see, you know, a review of the performance of the architect of CW Driver as they acted as both project manager and general contractor. Uh, our in-house management team, uh, our, you know, finance and accounting uh, are the are the broad brush pictures that I would see an outside consultant bringing to us. Thank you. Councilmember Petros. I appreciated uh, what uh, Councilmember Duffy uh, was suggesting of, you know, it is what it is. Let's move forward. Um, I don't believe that going back and reviewing costs and all of that really provide us any information that's useful as we move into the future. I think that that is just actually, I think it's a waste of, of uh, resources. I do like the notion of making sure that as we go forward with specific projects that we have a, that additional layer of oversight and review and that at, at some time in the future to be determined, Dave, by you and your staff when you're prepared to say, okay, after we do our goal setting or maybe with the budget, if these are going to be the next projects that come forward, here is possible ways to manage those so that we get efficiencies. Let me also add, this project is done. It is over. We're in it. The lights are on. Marina Park is almost complete, under budget, on time. Sunset Ridge Park, under budget, on time. Many, many public works projects for years, under budget, on time. This is not some type of, of uh, uh, epidemic of irresponsibility. Clearly, our public works department puts together projects that come in under budget and on time. So I'm looking forward to move forward, not look back. Thank you. Councilmember Muldoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my personal thoughts are that uh, it's a good report done by the staff. Appreciate you taking the time. And as Duffy said, I'm sure it was tough. Um, I feel that <clears throat> there definitely was some um, oversights at the staff level, but I think also there was a lot of political um, failings. And I think that's what the voters spoke about. So I, I don't see the need to, uh, to spend more money on that. As a matter of fact, I think we should focus on safeguarding the money from here going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Duffy. Uh, I don't have a lot to contribute any more further, but I would uh, in support um, Councilman Piotr's questions. If staff would uh, have time for doing that, I would, I would support um, the, the more uh, information he can get and share with us about what he learns from you guys, I think is, is good enough. It's good enough for me. I'm hoping that works. Thanks. Okay. And um, I'll just say that I think from, from my perspective on this, that I think the sentiments uh, expressed by Councilmember Petros really reflect my feeling at this time. The, we're in the building. It's done. We, we know we want to do better than next time around when we get specific projects. Um, um, we can start uh, looking at it at that point in time, but I think to to spend money on an outside um, audit or um, management investigation, whatever you want to call it, just seems to me to be money that's not wisely spent at this time, and we're better off looking to the future as to how we can do it better. So, Mr. Kiff, does that give you enough direction? Or? Let me state what I think I'm hearing. I'm hearing an inside staff effort to provide uh, the data requested by the public and and especially council member P. Otter. and I think we can do that we we want to do that um, at the same time um, prepare for because 
uh, to, to Mayor Pro Tem Dixon's concern, I do think you're going to face this decision sooner rather than later as to there's a project coming on, and if you want to do the project, how to do it. So um, what about if, if that doesn't occur between now and, say, the uh, March, um, that we don't have a project to look through this lens for, like the West Newport Community Center, we would come back to you as a staff with a more broader recommendation, a, a more broader analysis. But the expectation is that we'd have the focused, expect focused analysis that you're talking about in line with one specific project, as an example. If that's acceptable to you, I, that seems to be what collectively you're saying. Sort of. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, Dave. Okay, um, okay. What I I think that's a very good real world example as we go forward on the West Side Community right. Center, and in in some part of our discussions around it, you can even say. Here's what we're going to do differently that we right. didn't do before. We've learned okay. this now. We're going to have a design build. We're going to have an independent project coordinator manager. We're going to look at a specific budget. We're not going to have a Christmas tree approach and just add on everything that's nice. So there is that rigor in financial discipline. And I will accept that, and I'm comfortable that we've heard a lot. And I think on your own independently, you could talk to – professional, contractor, project manager types, and just bring them in and talk to them. What are the best practices? We don't, I don't need to hear all that. I'll, I won't micromanage that. But I think there's a, there are important external lessons that you could seek to the outside and how they manage these kinds of things that will inform your decision-making and recommendations going forward. So okay. long answer, yes, I support that. Okay. Thank you. I think I have a good sense now then. Yeah, Councilman Curry. Well, we're, we're catching up with this thing here. It's running late. But anyway, uh, I, as a, somebody who used to be a consultant, a uh, fairly high paid one, I'll just say that the way on this project to have avoided scope creep is to say no when the citizens ask for the emergency center and tell the library board no when they want a library and build lesser of a park. And uh, when the citizens went through and looked at the design competition and picked this building, it was not my choice, by the way, uh, say, no, we're going to go with something different. I mean, these were policy decisions that drove those scope decisions. That's Mr. Poyato and I agree on that. So that uh, consultant's not going to tell you that, although I'll send you a bill for that advice. Uh, uh, that comes really from policy discipline that comes up here. Okay. Any final thoughts anyone wants to relate to staff? Okay. We'll move on to our next item, which is study session item number four, discussion of Tidelands funds issues. Framing a Tidelands Audit RFP. Mr. Giff. So, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, um, this item you see on both your nighttime agenda and this agenda at this moment. And what we wanted to do was to, um, in light of, I, I think there's going to be a time consuming item tonight about the fire rings, um, we wanted to try to maybe spend some time with you this afternoon to frame that up, that discussion up for later tonight. And if you're comfortable with us, Proceeding with that, I will. But, but what what I was going to do uh, with Dan, uh, introducing Dan Matashevitz, the finance director, we're going to kind of look at um, something I worked with Councilmember Muldoon on, and that would be um, what kinds of Tidelands revenues are appropriate to count as Tidelands and what kinds of Tidelands expenditures. And I think that will help guide the later discussion tonight as to what might be included in that. So without any further question, I'll go to Dan and we'll start that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> I'll start with a quick overview of the city tidelands. Uh, the city tidelands are owned by the state of California. They're, they're granted in trust to the city and they're overseen by the State Lands Commission. Um, the city administers the Tidelands in trust on behalf of the people of, of California in accordance with the Beacon Bay Bill. Now, the Tidelands are largely those areas represented in light blue, um, and, but also goes um, to the ocean going three miles out to sea. 
Um, notice that the orange colors um, depict, depicted in this picture are county tidelands. So they're not, they're, although, although they're in the lower Newport Bay, they're, they're not city tidelands. As well as the upper Newport Bay um, are not city tidelands either. So council has directed staff uh, to develop a scope of an RFP to review or otherwise audit the Tidelands Trust. And, and I've outlined certain questions that we might ask, um, but, but staff suggests that the first step is to determine what is required by the, by the trust law known as the Beacon Bay. And, and so w once we've established uh, what the legal requirement is, Council may direct staff to make further changes to, to the Tidelands accounting, provided we don't contradict the trust. And council may choose to do more than the trust uh, requires, but may not do less than the trust provides. Um, in, in, in other words, council may direct staff uh, to account for Tidelands activities different, differently, provided it doesn't violate the trust. And, and so... Um, <clears throat> Council may wish uh, may also wish to look at Tidelands activity if if uh, if segregated by harbor and non-tart uh, uh, Tidelands activities. So, uh, by and large, th these are the questions that I, I think um, might be the first part of the R RFP uh, that that we would we would uh, look to ask. Income generated from Tidelands property are, are required to be accounted for as Tidelands activities. And getting into a real uh, world situation, I wanted to take a look at two, two particular areas, which are the Bellboy Yacht Basin and Beacon Bay. And if you, if you notice uh, the, the green and the shaded areas, it, um, the Tidelands boundaries aren't real convenient. So uh, you, you notice uh, that we can see in, in Balboa Yacht Basin that we have some areas where the slips are in tidelands and some areas that are actually in dredged uplands. So um, the revenue is, is, is accordingly split. Um, so Dan, in other words, what we do here is the green revenue goes into the general fund, the blue revenue goes into the tidelands fund. So we look at Beacon Bay those are the homes over there a little bit to the left on your screen. And we've actually figured out which home and even which parts of a home, because some of them are parts of homes, has to go in the Thailand's Trust. And similarly with the Yacht Basin, um, we look at the Yacht Basin as a certain number of slips, and you could see the rough number there. It's not all of them. It's a little more than half of them. Uh, go into the Thailand's Fund, and the rest go into the General Fund, um, as do the apartments and the garages that are out there. So... As Dan's saying, there's a legal aspect to it, but there's also a choice that the council could make. The council could always say, you know what, those are those rest of those slips, those are still water oriented and and you could put those towards some type of I, I still wouldn't call it the Tidelands Fund, I call it Tidelands Plus, because um, there's there's a legal box around the Tidelands Fund, but you could always say those Tidelands Plus funds are could be or should be counted as harbor related revenue. So I interrupted Dan if you want to go. Sure. Thank you, Dave. And, and, and one, one small distinction about the Balboa Yacht Basin is that you can see a lot of the apartments and, and some of the other uh, retail concessions are actually on uplands. But we take a look at this entire parcel and split it uh, on this pro rata shares. Um, so that, that's a slight distinction that we do, do in, in Beacon Bay. Beacon Bay, we go parcel by parcel, and if it's 50% if it's, uh, uplands, tidelands, we, we make that split. But in Balboa Yacht Basin, we, we took, take a look at the, the uh, in, entire service area. So we can start looking individually um, it, it, this is the matrix uh, that I believe uh, Mr. Muldoon and Dave came up with. And again, you, you can notice um, there are two, area, two areas that are blank, which is one, um, 
if you disagree with whether it's in Tidelands, how the city is treating it, um, does it deserve a further legal analysis of um, whether it uh, belongs in, in the Tidelands Trust? And then separate and apart from, from the legal uh, analysis, um, do we want to do something different um, uh, uh, with respect to those, those revenues? Um, by and large, whether it's marine charter tax, property tax, business licenses, those are all general taxes of the city. I, I, as a finance director, I, I would not recommend that you actually place them in the trust, but rather you can make decisions to take the general taxes of the city and using your budgetary discretion, choose to expend those general taxes uh, in, in a manner that you, you, you deem appropriate. Um. So it's really this slide we were hoping for some guidance on. Again, assuming that we're on the right path here with Mr. Muldoon's request, um, that it, as Dan's saying, wh which of these should we do a financial projection about? If we were to say, I think Mr. Muldoon suggested going back five years and going ahead five years, and we included these revenues, if we could... Some of the, some will be challenging. Some will not be challenging. But if we could project them, what would that what amount would that look like? And uh, so either now or later tonight was my hope that you'd kind of look at this list and say, yeah, I'd support this and I'd support or I wouldn't support that. Sorry, it's kind of obtuse in this, but this is kind of how study sessions work. Okay, uh, Councilmember Muldoon, this was your item that you initiated. Uh, any comments at this time? Uh, just some questions. Okay. <clears throat> so if we were to categorize this possibly as gray area, area that involves water but is not within the Thailand's boundaries, uh, how are the uh, harbor resource uh, uh, expenses allocated? I see that's, on, that's in the gray area. That's not technically on Thailand's. L literally the offices of harbor resources? <clears throat> the offices, yeah. the, uh, maintenance costs, uh, everything. Those, those are fully uh, allocated as expenditures to the Tidelands. So the, all of the harbor resources costs, even though the office itself isn't located on the Tidelands. It seems to be a gray area in its application on the other side as well. Okay. An inverse. Um, <clears throat> the Beacon Bay Bill interpretation. Uh, you interpret the Beacon Bay Bill to apply to more than parcels A, B, and C? And I think there's a D in there too, yes. There's a D in there? Yeah. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so we could possibly include that... An analysis. Um, so an analysis of if we're appropriately allocating A, B, C, and D? Well, if we're appropriately applying the, the bill to um, more than those formerly submerged parcels. I see. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> to go through the, uh, and the, I appreciate this list is extensive and you've categorized it y yay or nay as to whether or not it falls under that category. Um, how was it decided prior? It was just done a direction of council or was done internally as a common sense uh, management decision? We, well, it, it was generally decided internally and we'd bring it to council. Although, and I think there's been some uh, commentary in the community that um, it's not as robust a discussion, in fact, as we're having right now, mm -hmm. that we really break these down and show you what they look like. But um, literally, what we've looked at is what is inside the Tidelands boundary, what revenue source and what is, so I'll stick with revenue for, for now, what revenue source benefits the Tidelands. So that was yeah, half of the Beacon Bay ones and otherwise. And if something was outside the Tidelands as a revenue source, we typically wouldn't include it unless uh, there was a legal reason to do so. So w if anything, we've been... We've stuck with the legal stricture. We haven't decided or asked the council to decide to expand that. But that is something the council could always do. Thank you. Councilmember Member Duffy. Um, okay, this is a, a big subject. And um, Councilman Piotr and I had an interesting uh, Friday. We met with the... Uh, finance director and deputy finance director and 
we learned that there's a lot to learn. And I would, after meeting with them, propose that um, we take some more time before we um, try and do an RFP or, or spend any monies with an audit. Um, what I learned in an hour and a half, um, I know it's going to take another however many hours, and I appreciate the um, knowing all this stuff. And, and if there's a lot more to it than, than just numbers. There's legalities that I certainly was not aware of. And uh, so to get to a real uh, comprehensive audit uh, without knowing uh, the real information and, and what you're trying to do on the expense side as well as the income side, I would prefer to... Uh, to um, take some time with um, those gentlemen as they have it over the next couple, three weeks and be more educated. Councilman Curry. <clears throat> uh, well, I appreciate uh, Councilmember Duffield's uh, approach on this because I actually learned some things watching these slides too. And I think it's, uh, you know, uh, audit becomes sort of a shorthand, uh, you know, word for let's get information so we can make decisions. The issue is, is there a better way to get the information in a more thoughtful way as we go through this process to do it that's less costly to the taxpayers? Can you go back to that list of questions that you had, Dan, That uh, your previous slide? There you go. Uh, first of all, so Beacon Bay is, the Beacon Bay Bill has been around since 1974. We perform an audit of our Tidelands funds every year for submittal to the State uh, Lands Commission and other state controllers, don't we? We do submit a report to the State Lands Commission. Right. So we have all of the, if you will, raw data that, it, if you will, an auditor would audit and would, would calculate. And we've been doing this now for some time. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and we also have a situation where, and I'm thinking about to our dredging of Lower Bay, where we use general fund revenues fairly extensively for Tidelands purposes. Is that accurate? That is correct. And, in fact, we spend more general fund revenues, you know, than the Tidelands generate for Tidelands-related purposes. Is that that's correct, right? That is also correct. Okay. Are there any questions here that you have sort of postulated that uh, you don't have the data to answer yourself if we were to ask you to go answer them? Well, um, I, I think there are a number of questions. In my mind, it's 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 pretty clear, but there are, there have been a number of, of of questions circulating out in the community that. Well, let's take these four questions here. Could you answer these four questions? Yes, and, and yes. All right. So, without the benefit of a hundred thousand dollar a year consultant, you could do that. Correct. All right. So maybe what we and I and I appreciate Councilman Duffield being very thoughtful about this. Let's start with gathering information incrementally, answer these questions, and then see whether we need to move forward uh, with more consultant activity uh, after we've had a chance to evaluate uh, what we know ourselves. Mayor Pro Tem Dixon. Well, if I'm understanding this, if if we can get answers to these questions that staff has provided and we can do that ourselves internally let's look at those answers first and then that will point the direction further to see where we need to look at doing things differently or allocating differently or what have you i'm totally comfortable with that thank you mayor Councilmember petros i like the way this direction is going and i've got nothing else to add Councilmember member uh, ditto on that okay, same here any public comment? Okay, seeing none, uh, staff need any further direction from us? Do you feel clear on that, Dan? Um, we'll make a, a staff effort to, it's, I guess it's kind of a combination education and research gathering process, and uh, s starting with uh, the team that's met with Dan already, and uh, report back to the council on a uh, one of the meetings in February with that. That's okay. acceptable to you folks. And you okay. can decide what to go from there. Okay, sounds good. Madam Clerk. Public comments. The city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the city council. If the optional sign-in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. 
The City Council of Newport Beach <laughs> welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are invited on items listed on the agenda and non-agenda items. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The City Council has dis discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. Okay, are there any public comments on non-agenda or closed session items? My excitement, I spoke out of turn, so I would like to insert my comment here. Sorry, I'm still in therapy trying to get over my... Come forward, please. <laughs> Oh, you're inserting him here. I understand. Thank you, Roy. I've got a support group for <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mosier. <clears throat> Mayor Salich and members of the council, my name again is Jim Mosier. Uh, I believe this will be the first closed session for most of you, so I wanted to say a few words about closed sessions in general. First, I wanted to let you know that until it was rewritten by Measure EE in 2012, it is a little known fact and a universally ignored one that the Newport Beach City Council required, City Charter required all meetings of the council to be held in the city chambers and in public. It also required all the meetings of the boards and commissions to be open to the public. In other words, closed sessions were not allowed even though they were held. Since Measure EE, the public has only the protection of the Brown Act, and what I wanted to tell you about that is that the Brown Act allows for the council to meet privately in closed session, but it never requires that. In particular, it articulates a list of a few acceptable topics that can be printed on the agenda, but none of those are intended simply to avoid embarrassment or criticism of what the council might be discussing. In view of that, when you attend the closed sessions, I hope that you will consider whether the information you hear there is sometimes in information of general interest that could and should be shared with the public in open session. As an example, regarding the first item you have on tonight's closed session agenda, Human Resources Director Cassidy said at the Civil Service Board meeting last night that she and City Manager Kiff would be bringing the new members of the council up to speed on the, how the negotiations are conducted in Newport Beach with the city's many labor groups. How negotiations are conducted as opposed to the con negotiations themselves seems to me like a matter of general interest that does not need to be protected by the closed door. Regarding the litigation items that are on the next page of your agenda, I had a chance to attend the appeals court hearing last month where the oral arguments were presented on the Woody's Wharf matter. I don't know if the city attorney, because it's in closed session, will be discussing a settlement with you, but if he relates what happened at the court session in December, I hope he will mention to you the concerns that were raised there and seem to be concerns of some of the judges about our system here in Newport Beach in which individual council members can call up issues for hearing before the city council and then themselves sit on the city council in judgment of those matters and also the impression that council members can create through their words or through their actions that they had reached a conclusion before hearing the evidence. I have no idea what the court will decide in that matter, but the proper way to conduct public meetings does not seem to me to be a topic that needs to be discussed in private. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? Seeing none, we'll now adjourn to closed session. Mr. City Attorney, do you have any announcement on closed session items? Yes, thank you, Mayor Selich. Uh, the City Council will adjourn to closed session to discuss labor negotiations between the city and all represented employees with the city's labor negotiators, Dave Kiff and Deputy City Manager Terry Cassidy, and to meet with legal counsel regarding exist existing litigation, including Woody's Grouping versus Newport Beach, City of Newport Beach versus Lido Partners and Friends of the Fire Rings versus South Coast Air Quality Management District.